space behind me very well. <laughs> I would now like to formally introduce Mr. Eleanor. So when I started reading your book, um, right in the very first chapter, you relate how when you first started interviewing scientists for PBS, you made a decision to put the book down and just be really curious. So I put your book down. So my question is, what led up to this connection of science, communication, and improv? Clearly three very deep passions for you. Yeah, that's true. Well, I'd always been interested in science since I was a little kid. I didn't, I didn't know what science was. I used to do experiments when I was six years old. I called them experiments. I would mix my mother's face powder and toothpaste to see if I could get it to blow up. <laughs> to me, science was making things blow up. I could, thank God I couldn't reach the things in the house that if you mix, really do blow up. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't reach them. But uh, I was, I was an, an amateur inventor who invented things when I was 10 and built models of them. So I was always interested in that. And then quite, oh, look at there, you got your own personal microphone. That's wonderful. Right. So uh, then the only training I ever had in acting, the only actual training outside of standing in the wings watching my father act and watching burlesque comedians and Broadway actors. I've really learned almost everything watching from the wings, except the most important thing, which I learned from improvising. And it's the most important thing to me, it's spontaneity. Because if you figure out a performance and you think you got it, what you don't got is spontaneity. You don't have the connection with the other person. And what I began to realize Finally, after trying to be a good actor for years, I finally realized that I don't say my next line because it's written in the script or because I've memorized it. I say the next line because the other actor does something or says something that makes me say the line. It makes me say it a certain way. So I'll be, I'll be very different in subtle ways each time I say it, even though it's the same line. And that I learned from improvising. But what I learned from improvising more than that was that kind of spontaneity is really, really important in life, in dealing with other people. And I, the training I had was with Paul Sills and a little bit with Viola Spohan. Viola came into our sessions a couple of times. And, and that was transformative for me. And I, I imagine I could tell from that uh, mild outburst that uh, a lot of people there are familiar with Viola's work, right? I mean, it's, it's changed. I think it's changed. Yeah. I think Viola changed the way acting is taught and the way it's performed in this country. I think she's had a more profound effect I have no way of knowing for sure, but I just sense it more profound than uh, the New York version of the method ha had. It had a big effect around the world at the time. But, but Viola is so fundamental in what she, what she has come up with, what she came up with, that uh, it, 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 it's something once you do, you're changed for a long time, maybe maybe forever. So that changed me. And when, and then this is sort of answering your question in a long roundabout about way. What brought the improvising and the interest in science together was when I was asked to do a program on public television called Scientific American Frontiers, which I did for 11 years. And then for another couple of years, we did more science mini series. And in that 
process of trying to do a show where I was really just trying to understand what the scientists were telling me, I found out that the only way that could happen is if we got a close personal connection. That was a conversation where I didn't have a list of questions. I didn't, I didn't go in just tossing them questions and asking them to then in a way talk to the camera instead of to me. I wanted them to tell me what they did in science so I could personally understand it. If I didn't understand it, I wouldn't let go. I just, I'd grab them by the shirt and shake them. <laughs> this went over very well once or twice. <laughs> so, so uh, I realized that what we were doing was improvising. And when the show was over, I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful to have scientists have this ability to get personal like this, to let the real them come out, which happened when we had real conversations. They were who they were. If they were funny, that funniness came out. If they were ambitious, that came out. All, all the humanity in them came out. So I thought, what if we teach them improvisation as a way, as a foundation for learning to communicate in a richer, more personal way? And that was about 10 years ago, I started experimenting with that, 10 or more. And then we started the Center for Communicating Science at Stony Brook University. And since then, in the past eight years, we've trained over 8,000 scientists and doctors. And that's been across the United States and now we've expanded to uh, Europe and Australia. We're, we're in Australia. We're, we just came back from Dundee, Scotland and, and uh, Ireland. And in about an hour, I have to leave to go to Oslo to uh, train scientists in Oslo. Thank you. So if you're away, if you're still awake, I'm ready for another question. All right. <laughs> is, it, is anybody still awake? Okay. Yeah. I can see you. <laughs> <laughs> we, you've answered this a little bit. Uh, we'd love to hear what for you um, is the most fulfilling and compelling part of training scientists with improvisation. You know, it's really extraordinary to see the difference. And sometimes just after a one day workshop, because we work on two things. We, we, we do basic improvisation exercises. And in one day, we don't even have a chance to get into scenes. We do exercises like mirroring. Uh, I love to do mirroring speech with them. And, uh, I, I like to do gibberish with them. A lot of basic things that open them up. Uh, then we work on the content of what they want to say. First, we work on getting them to understand what it's like to have a communication that's, that's a two-way street, where they learn to observe the person they're trying to communicate with because we can't do these games unless we're really acutely observing the other person. And you can't communicate something unless you're observing the other person. Where are they? What are they understanding? Mm -hmm. What did they come in with? How, how, how far in can you start? Maybe you have to start way, way early in your explanation of the scientific idea. Somebody asked me once, what's the Higgs boson? And I had just come back from CERN where they had discovered it. So I started launched into this thing. Well, the Higgs boson is a particle that is, comes out of the Higgs field and it helps make other particles uh, have mass. And I, start, I started to go on like that. And she said, wait, hold it. What's a particle? <laughs> well, I started too far in. And you have to, you can only know by looking at their face and getting their tone of voice and asking questions to find out where they really are so you can keep them up with you. And you know what I love about the mirror exercise, which is what I like to do before I do anything else, is what, what I like about it is that you learn that you both have to 
be very observant of each other, but the person who's leading, the person looking into the mirror, has the responsibility of helping the other person follow. It's like in improv, your job is to make your partner look good. Mm. If they don't follow you, it's not their fault, it's your fault. There's no blame, but, it, but you gotta pay attention. <laughs> There's no blame, but you're full of shit if you don't help them follow. <laughs> I mean that in the nicest way, you know. <laughs> so you didn't see what I mean? That this thing of that what what these exercises do, we they we make we try to make it clear to them that these are not comedy improvisations. We're not teaching them to be funny. We're not uh, teaching them to be quick on their feet, although they will become a little quicker on their feet. We're teaching them simply to make the connection. And once they make that connection and let the people they're talking to into their consciousness, it'll change the way they talk. It'll change their vocabulary. It'll even change the look on their faces. Mm -hmm. I find that happens to me. When I'm really focusing on the other person, it changes what's happening on my face. And I see it happen. It changes. That changes in turn what's happening on the other person's face. It's really... It, it becomes at an unconscious level, an open channel in a two-way street. I'm not giving you much of a chance to ask questions. No. With, right. You're, no, really, you are. You're answering the questions. And what you're also doing is you're validating the work that we know um, and love and have also found true. So I, I, I would like to know here <laughs> now... You found, pardon me? I was just asking, haven't you found... Have, have, haven't you found that doing improvising games, doing Viola's games, changes you as a person? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. Absolutely. You know, a it, lot of us go into... extraordinary. But I also feel that you... Go ahead, go ahead. No, but no, I, you I, go I'm ahead. you talk now. No, they, they hear me all the time. Go ahead. No, I forgot. <laughs> All right, well, then what I do want to go to then is what have you been most surprised about with your work and with the scientists and in your, um, at your center? There's some actual surprises. One is they have begun to tell us, um, scientists have begun to tell us that they actually understand their own work better the more the more they learn to communicate it to people who don't understand it very well. So we are a fairly diverse group of people in terms of our discipline and how we use improvisation. And a lot of people are also a little distressed about the state of the world. Um, we're wondering how you think about our tools and how they can be used to address things in the world um, in addition to what you're doing? Well, the, the, I, one of the other surprising things that scientists have told us is that what we train them to do with communication works in their private lives <laughs> as well. One, yeah. one scientist said to me, this training has saved my marriage. <laughs> so this is why I wrote the book that just came out where I, I talk a little bit about how we train scientists and I talk about uh, the method we use, but I mainly talk about how it applies in all the other areas of all our lives. Uh, and interestingly, you talk about the broader world perspective. Not only can we personally communicate better and make ourselves clearer, but I, I've read uh, uh, the diplomats writing about diplomacy who said you can't do diplomacy without, without taking into account the other person's perspective which is what empathy is and empathy is what happens when we do these uh, Viola Spolin uh, theater games because we're reading one another. You can't do a scene unless you're reading the other person. It's not that the other person says something to you. The other person behaves in a way that's 
totally below a conscious level, to a great extent below it. And unless you're in sync with that other person, learn to do that, you're not reading and you're not really growing in empathy. And you're really able to live in the other person's perspective. So it seems to me that this kind of work can lead to better and more widespread diplomacy if we ever decide to go back to diplomacy, of course. All right. Yes. So I, I did continue reading your book. Uh, fabulous book, by the way. Uh, yeah, please. Great book. We, we'll also be selling it here. Um, what is your best strategy for selling improv as a training tool other than being Alan Alda? I haven't tried it as anybody else. <laughs> It's, it's a good idea. I'll put on a beard and a fright wig and see how it goes next time. <laughs> I, uh, you're right. Uh, there is, is often resistance. There's, there are often people who say, oh, yeah, it's t touchy feely stuff. And uh, I don't think so. Uh, the only thing I can suggest is m most of the people we're trying to help with this uh, method, this approach, most of them are really interested in what they call metrics. They want to know what the results have been in the past. So the more we can build that, <clears throat> excuse me, the more we can build that up and document it and have studies that show that it works, uh, the more we can say, here, look at this. We're not just, uh, this isn't just a crazy idea. It's not enough for us, for instance, even using my name, uh, it's not enough to even say we've trained 8,000 scientists and medical professionals. We also have to show the, the few studies that have been done so far that document the research, doc, that, I'm sorry, that document the success rates we've had. So I think we just have to look for more, keep, keep searching the uh, research files and see what uh, what documentation exists and use that to sell the idea because it's so valuable it shouldn't have to be sold with any difficulty but to some extent it still is i wanted to follow that up because we find that as well there are a lot of people who are interested but they're they're absolutely evidence um, based and, and results oriented so one of the questions is uh, what kinds of research do you think uh, would be useful what kinds of research are you doing are you, at the institute well the thing is that there are really strict guidelines for research that uh, is acceptable in the academic community. And you really can't do it um, on, a, on, a, on, a, on an amateur basis. I think the idea is to get interested people, maybe at universities, to donate their time and, and do it uh, under controlled conditions, they have to get what's called IRB permission from, I think it's IRB. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We have a lot of academics in the group. Yeah, good. I mean, they, for, for some reason, they don't like it to experiment on humans. I don't get it. <laughs> but uh, if you can get people to, to do that or to, to fund it, uh, a couple of our studies have been funded by outside groups. The NIH funded one study uh, at a uh, research hospital in, in Arizona, and that's been very valuable to us. And, and, and the uh, uh, Cleveland Hospital funded another one, training hospital. So we're doing, uh, we're getting by with a little research, but as time goes on and as we get more funds, we plan to do a lot more research too, because it's very, it's very important to, to be accurate about the claims we make. And not only that, the research helps us improve the programs that we teach, what does work and what doesn't work. That's the end of that. Yeah. No. <laughs> so, Alan, um, what has no one asked you yet that you would like to be asked? 
You know, nobody ever asks me what time it is. Ah! <laughs> and I have a really nice watch. That's, oh, that's sure. It's a Timex, and if you press the button, it glows in the dark. And, I, and I, you know, like at a, I'll be at a movie, and and I could just like turn it on. And oh. What time is it? <laughs> <laughs> It's two o'clock. Woo! Where I am. I don't know what's different where you are. It's 11. Um, one of the interesting discussions that we have uh, in our community uh, is sort of the difference between what happens on the stage and what happens in using improvisation in more applied ways. Um, particularly, let's say, the celebration of mistakes. Uh, so I'm wondering how you work with um, your scientists around mistakes and uh, in incorporating the principle of quote unquote celebrating mistakes when the stakes might be quite high. We, uh, we do something that we call the clown bow. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we only call it that, or do you have something like that? Yeah, they, people call it the failure bow, or the clown yeah, bow, yeah. We stamp our foot and raise both hands yeah. and say, ta-da. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, this is so valuable that I use it during the day. I don't actually, in the, when I'm in a bank, I don't stamp my foot and scream <laughs> and wave my arm. But, but I, I hear myself say, ta-da, and I get over little mistakes. It's really valuable. And when it, this is a really good example of what seems trivial when we show them how to do it. And it's fun for them to do, and they laugh when they do it. And sometimes we have to tell them a few times, you know, this is really a profound thing you just learned. And you can take it with you, take it out of this workshop, and make it a part of your life because it's not just something to loosen you up and make you feel happy for a few minutes. It's, I mean, I know from my own experience that clown bow, as we call it, is liberating. And the more you carry it through all the work, the, the better the improv gets, but also the better life gets, I found. Thank you. Thank you. So, this was a question from uh, one of the applied improvisers here. Um, what can applied improv practitioners do for people living under the risk of war? Under the risk of war. How can we uh, use improv to help people who are maybe in combat zones or something like that? Correct. I'm assuming. Yes. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I never thought about it. It's an interesting idea. Uh, it's a liberating, uh, it's a liberating form of uh, learning, and it not only is liberating; it gives you strengths, it gives you ability to cope with things. So I imagine it would be very helpful. How you organize such a thing, I have no idea. Uh, I'm thinking of um, one of the people who works with us. Also works with uh, the police. And they're under a lot of stress, and helps them uh, helps them overcome that. So I, I am I am aware a little bit of of what you're talking about, but I don't know how it would be organized. It, uh, that sounds like the the first task. But look, this 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 approach that we're talking about, that we're all gathered to talk about, is so valuable that it applies to almost every human activity, as far as I can see. But what I've also found, and I think this is very important, is one size does not fit all. What we did with scientists when we started to work with doctors and nurses, we had to adapt to them. I started a company to help support the, the Alda Center for Communicating Science, and that company is called Alda Communication Training, or Act. You got to say it like that. And, and the idea there is to go into corporations and teach, uh, starting with improv, to teach leadership and uh, team building. And our first pro project was for women in business. And 
we, we, as we prepared for it and as we did it, we found that some of the things that worked with scientists and doctors also worked for women in business and some of them didn't. And we had to make new connections between what we know about improv and the exercises that, that, we, that we know work and what the needs are of the people we're working with. So it, we, for instance, we, it, it works in a lot of different ways, even training scientists. We worked with scientists at IBM and the, their particular problem was, and we had to understand what their problem was by talking to them first, instead of just going in and training them. Their problem was they had been preparing a project for a year, about four or five teams, each had been working on a different project. And at the end of the year, they had to present their project to vice presidents who themselves were not scientists, but they wanted maybe a billion dollars to get the project ready to sell to the public. So they had 15 minutes to communicate this to non-scientists. So we worked with them, we did several workshops with them and we, you could see them learn to talk about their project, but we tailored it to their particular needs. And it worked so well, they brought us back again this year and we're, we're having an ongoing relationship with them. But the, it's, it's an example of listening to the other person. Before you try to help them with improv, you gotta find out what they need, where they are in their lives, how improv can actually help them in a specific way. That's the end of that. Here's another question from one of our group members. Uh, have you ever uh, had a group where people did not do what you wanted them to do? They were resistant, and how do you deal with resistance in your participants? Yeah, the, the, those of us who, have, who train uh, doctors and scientists very, very, every once in a while, or as with doctors, I think it's even more frequent. Uh, they, or doctors or med students, they don't, um, they often or sometimes don't think they need it or they've or, they're already there. And, but, and I've even had a training actors. Uh, I, ha I had a group of about uh, 15 actors that I worked with for a week, all day long, every day for a week just improvising and one of them, these were people with 20 or 30 years experience on the stage. One of them was so scared about improvising that she told me later she was planning to fake a heart attack. To <laughs> and her experience was very similar to the doctors I've seen who were most resistant, the ones who were most resistant once they get their toe in the water and realize that something's happening and it's beneficial, they make the best progress. And this actress made the most progress in that workshop. It was a fascinating experience. That's great because we, we run it. We run. We face that a lot. Um, you have a technique for getting around it. What do you do? You know what? We do, right? Yeah, we do. Well, I, I mean, I didn't give you a technique. I don't. I think it's just uh, little by little getting them into it, into the simplest things. Exactly. Exactly. And also, with the people we work with, it's not like working with actors who are accustomed to being in a mysterious void of information. That where they they don't they they expect not to know what's going on and have trust and faith that something positive will come out of this exercise. Doctors and medical students and scientists are very busy and they don't have a lot of time. And they want to know that this is going to be valuable to do. And we have to keep reassuring them that this is fun, but it's not just fun. It's going to lead to something specific. And Viola cautions against telling you what you're going to get out of an exercise. And we find that when we do it with scientists, we sometimes or often have to tell them what they're going to get out of it. And it doesn't seem to hurt mm -hmm. we have to operate partly on a, on a rational basis, along with 
an intuitive basis. And actors are more comfortable just putting aside the intellect and working intuitively. But when you're working with people who simply won't do that, it doesn't seem to hurt to meet them halfway. So I'd like to follow that up with what's on your horizon in this arena? Well, I want uh, with 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 science. I want to see. I want to see the education of scientists change radically all over the world, and the education. And the education of uh, medical professionals, because there's a very direct link between the way they communicate with patients and the health of the patients. There's a longer term effect if scientists communicate better, but it's vital because they're not going to get money to do science. They're not going to get government policy that actually listens to science unless they communicate in a way that people can understand. But I want to see all of that change around the world. And then, and then we have a little better chance of surviving. Um, I think it's kind of, it, we have daily reminders that communication, and poor communication can kill us. And I, I just want to see it change. I want to see it get better. And we, we've made some May, I think we've made a real contribution to that, but there's plenty more to do. Okay, so our last question is, as we mentioned, we have a global network of over 6,000 people around the world who use improvisation for all kinds of things, including the kind of work you're doing. And Well, I just, hope, I just hope that every single one of those 6,000 people is well and healthy and goes out and buys my book. Yeah. <laughs> we are selling your we are selling your book. You may have said it before, but I'm going to be shameless. Yeah. The book is called If I Understood You, would I have this look on my face? Yeah. I I want to say you should be That was the commercial. Now you can answer. No. You should be shameless. I do want to say to the audience, it's actually awesome. It is an amazing blend of narrative and, and grounded research and science. Go get it if you haven't already. Um, it's in our bookstore. Uh, but the question we want to leave you with, and it doesn't have to be fully answered, but, but given that we have over 6,000 members, how can we support the kind of work you're doing? How can we continue to advance this work? How can we partner? How can we stay connected to the overall goal of using improvisation to increase empathy, communication, theory of mind, and a better world? I just think it's wonderful that you have all these people so connected to improv and to this, as far as I understand it, this very fundamental kind of improv that's related to Viola Spolin's work, which I think is so valuable. And I'm, I'm really glad to see that you're, you're connected and spreading the word. And I, the only thing I can suggest is use the improvisational spirit, <clears throat> pardon me, the improvisational spirit that, that improv builds in you and reach out. You know, we used to say when we were improvising on the stage, when you don't know what's happening in the scene, you don't know what's coming next, and you're totally stuck, just reach into the dark and pull out an answer. Mm. And I would just say to you that, no, it sounds weird, but reach into the dark and pull out the answer to how you can spread this. Be, be brave. Improv makes you brave and just call people up and say, we want to work with you and we think we can help and then find out what they need and tailor it to them and it'll spread more and more. I'm, I'm very happy that you all have come together to do this and I applaud you. Woo! We are grateful for your work. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.
Thank you for standing, but I can't see you. Uh -huh. Enjoy <laughs> Oslo. Thank you, Alan. From all of us, thank you. Thanks so much. Go run and buy the book right now. I'm definitely going right out to buy it myself. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye.